All right, ready to go. All the technology in place. Um, good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, uh, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and uh, we're, we're very delighted uh, this evening to be hosting Nicole Hemmer, uh, who's here to talk about her, her new book, The Partisans, The Conservative Revolutionaries Who Remade American Politics. Uh, Nicole's a, a political historian and founding director of the new Center for the Study of the Presidency at Vanderbilt University. She's also a co-founder of Made by History, the historical analysis section in the Washington Post, and she writes regularly for a number of other publications. In a book six years ago, Messengers of the Right, uh, Nicole traced the emergence of conservative media institutions in the mid-20th century. In her new work, she examines why the Republican Party in the 1990s shifted from the kind of conservatism that Ronald Reagan had represented in, in the previous decade, a conservatism that was optimistic and, and popular, to a more pessimistic, angrier, even revolutionary conservatism. It was a period, Nicole writes, of intensifying partisan conflict when a new fury took hold on the right and when Republicans grew less tolerant of dissension uh, in the ranks and began viewing Democrats not as opponents, uh, but as enemies. Uh, what accounted for this shift? Well, Nicole cites uh, a number of factors, which uh, she'll get into in a minute. But understanding why it happened is important, because it remains very relevant today. As Nicole explains, it set Republicans on a course that led eventually to the election of Donald Trump and to the radicalization of the right. Now, we're in for a very informative discussion with Nicole, who will be in conversation this evening with one of the most astute political analysis and uh, analysts in Washington today, journalist and author uh, E.J. Dion. He's also a longtime friend of, of PNP and of mine and Lissa's. Uh, in addition to writing a, an always interesting column for the Washington Post, uh, E.J. is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and teaches at Georgetown. He's also the author or co-author of a, a number of books uh, about politics. His latest, 100% Democracy, which was co-written with uh, Miles Rappaport and published last March, uh, makes a, a very persuasive case for universal voting. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Nicole Hemmer and E.J. Dion. Uh, thank you, Brad, and thanks to our friends at C-SPAN and the audience out there. I love doing events at this bookstore. As everybody in this room knows, this bookstore is also a community organization. It's a community builder. I love the people who work here. Brad and Lisa inherited a tradition they kept it alive and built on it. And to keep a tradition alive, you've got to build on it. And they've done great things with this bookstore. And I am so pleased and honored to be with Nicole. I got to say, I love this book. Um, I, it's a, probably the highest compliment I can give it uh, is that you don't realize how much you're learning because the book is so engaging as you race through it. Um, and I also like it for a very particular maybe even selfish reason, uh, because in 1992, I was assigned to cover Pat Buchanan's presidential campaign by the Washington Post and spent a lot of time on that campaign. Uh, and uh, I now learn from uh, Nicole uh, how historically important that campaign is. And you know, journalists write the first draft of history, so I even made a couple of footnotes I discovered in the book. Um, but she makes a very, very compelling case that um, basically Reaganism and its influence uh, ended almost as soon as he left office, which is not uh, something we usually uh, uh, assume. Um, and the case she makes is really powerful. And so, Nicole, why don't, to, why don't you just start there by explaining how you came to that view, how you make the case here, um, because as you know, people kept making references to Reagan and how much they were Reaganite, even as they were moving away and doing so quite quickly. Well, first of all, thank you so much for doing this tonight. You are an inspiration as a writer, so all of those, um, those kind mm -hmm. words mean quite a lot to me. Well, um, thank you. 
So, you know, this book in many ways began with just the puzzle that EJ was talking about, that the mythology of Reagan grew exponentially in the 1990s and the 2000s, and yet a particular set of politics that Reagan embraced were under challenge almost immediately after he let, left office. And this was something that I started thinking about as I was finishing my first book. I was writing about Reagan's election, and I wrote in the book, a little too preciously, that it was both a victory and a valedictory. It was the triumph of this Cold War conservative movement, but it also felt like a curtain call, like, like something was coming to an end. Um, what ultimately was coming to an end was the Cold War. And what I realized as I was working through the argument of this book was Ronald Reagan was fundamentally a Cold War president. That the Cold War provided a kind of logic, a kind of language for his conservatism. And what that meant wasn't just that he spoke the language of democracy and freedom, um, something that he didn't always live out in reality, but that he really appealed to throughout, but that that language and that argument about democracy and freedom affected certain parts of his policies. Um, he truly believed that the free movement of people and goods was part of democratic capitalism. Um, and so you read him on immigration and he sounds quite a lot like a Democrat sometimes, uh, especially compared to today's Republican Party um, and on trade. So these kinds of things that were core to the conservative movement and during the Cold War, and because Reagan was so popular, even though he had real critics on the right, I mean, there was a subset of conservatives who just punched at Reagan every day of his presidency, but they found it difficult to land those punches. Um, but as soon as he leaves office, as soon as the Cold War ends, it opens up this space for what was at least in part an anti-small-D democratic conservatism that Pat Buchanan represents. You know, one of the fascinating things is the psychology of Reaganism, more than anything, was quite different from the psychology of the later right whose rise you uh, describe, and I, I always thought the power of Reagan came partly because even though he forgot all the ideas, he never really stopped being an optimistic New Dealer. You know, he, he kept Roosevelt's optimism and, and shelved most of the policies. Can you talk about that psychological difference? And he did have support from some of that same far right in his rise, you know, including the Birch Society and others, but he didn't convey that in the way the right that came along afterward did. Right, that optimism, that emotion at the heart of Reaganism is really important. And I think this is an important caveat. It was an optimism that was heard by white voters. Um, you know, he was not popular, as popular as he was, right? He, he left office as one of the most popular presidents in modern US history. He was never popular with black voters or with Hispanic voters. Um, so we're talking about a particular subset of voters here, but to them, his appeals were deeply optimistic. He appealed sometimes to fear and resentment, but oftentimes to that kind of mourning in America sentiment. Um, and the right that would come after him was not interested in that. They weren't interested in pragmatism or popularity, and they certainly weren't in interested in optimism. They were focused on a much darker version of the United States and a much darker version of conservatism and the right, something that, for those of you who remember the 1992 campaign, was very present in Pat Buchanan's convention speech in 1992. Yeah, if, uh, so there were liberals in the audience who'd say, aren't you being awfully nice to Reagan in this account? And I was really struck by a phrase uh, in your book. I have, I, I, if you look, you'll see I read this very carefully. It's full of notes. And at the top of this page, I wrote provocative of this <laughs> sentence. Um, you referred to the colorblind racism of the Reagan era. And one thing I was thinking about as, as it went along is, you know, when we try to think of the roots you know, of Trumpism, on the one hand, you make a very persuasive case that what followed was quite different. And yet there were also some continuities. I wonder if you could talk about the continuities as well. Absolutely, and sometimes the continuities or the differences are differences of degree and sometimes they're differences of kind. But that colorblind racism idea is really important. Um, it's the difference between the dog whistle and the bullhorn. And 
you can argue that they're the same ideas that are just packaged or presented in different ways, but it does matter if you feel like you have to appeal to universalism, if you have to put an optimistic spin on opportunity, if you have to appeal to equality versus saying, for instance, that um, IQ is genetically determined and it depends on your race, um, an idea that becomes very popular in the mid 1990s. But I think that it's also important to emphasize that Reagan is still in the DNA of the conservative movement. Um, and ideas, particularly like deep tax cuts, um, certainly remain, um, although they get more dogmatic after Reagan. Reagan, of course, famously cut taxes and then he raised them a couple of times um, and didn't face the same kind of backlash that somebody like George H.W. Bush did. Um, but so there are some there are some continuities, but in the things that made Reaganism, Reaganism, what made it distinct from Cold War conservatism as a movement, that emotion that you're talking about, that willingness to compromise, and that idea of the big tent, um, the idea that there are Reagan Democrats as opposed to the 1990s when you get rhinos, Republicans in name only, the, the shrinking um, boundaries of conservatism, those differences still seem important despite the continuities. There are a lot of things to get to, and I just want to mention a couple because we might not, but you should read the book. Uh, you'll learn things, you'll either re be reminded of things you forgot or you'll learn things you never know. For example, uh, did you know that Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram both got their starts on MSNBC? Um, and there's some great stuff on the changes in the media, which I do want to get to. Um, and there is also, I think, uh, something you explore that we've forgotten is there was a real turn on the right on immigration a long time ago, which uh, we can talk about. And National Review, which had long held the Reagan view when it published Peter Brimlow and that very uh, rightly controversial, that's, that's a nice thing to say about a book, uh, that he wrote. Um, uh, th there, there are some great things there, but I, I want to go to two immediately political things. Um, we all like it when a smart historian confirms something you thought, and so I'm grateful for your insight that what the conservatives had against Reagan, they actually held against George W. Bush, um, uh, George H. W. Bush, rather, and, and then later, in some ways, George W. Bush, whom you describe as the last Reaganite, but the, a lot of the, the, the knocks on George H.W. Bush were really knocks you could have made of Reagan, but he was um, sort of such a hero that it was impossible to land those punches. And then they all went to H.W. Can you talk about that transition? And then I do want to talk a bit about Pat Buchanan's uh, campaign. Yeah. It, it's so fascinating because once you realize that's what's happening, it's impossible not to see. Um, so you have these these um, hardcore conservatives, they called themselves the New Right, who were constantly complaining about Reagan. They complain about him from the very start of his presidency. Um, they're not able to make any headway because he's popular, as I, as I mentioned before. When George H.W. Bush comes into office, they're like, all right, this is our guy because this is our punching bag because he he didn't have the conservative credentials. He was always suspect. Um, he was somebody who had been part of the Ford administration. They don't like the Ford administration. He was somebody who um, was seen as the moderate alternative to Reagan in 1980, and they never trusted his conservative bona fides. And so that forced him into kind of a corner to have to make promises like read my lips, no new taxes. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, Reagan raised taxes, two of the biggest tax hikes in American history in 1982 and 1984. Um, but it is when George H.W. Bush raises taxes that they not only lose it, but that their complaints gain traction. Um, same thing happens with debates over affirmative action. Um, when George W. Bush doesn't sign what was called, um, or ends up signing uh, what the right to write it as a quota bill in 1991, um, that is something, you know, Ronald Reagan had um, reluctantly advanced affirmative action policies too during his presidency, but it's George H.W. Bush who 
really takes it on the chin um, for advancing those policies or for compromising. Um, any pragmatism from Reagan was part of his appeal. Pragmatism in George H.W. Bush was signs of heresy. Um, and it's those ideas that George H.W. Bush was a heretic that made it easier for Pat Buchanan to run in 1992. You may have forgotten that in 1988, Pat Buchanan wanted to run. He floats a trial balloon for a campaign in uh, the spring of 1987 while he's still part of the Reagan administration. Um, and he realizes very quickly that he's just going to be a sacrificial lamb for the new right, and he lets Pat Robertson take that role instead, and he waits four more years. And once he's running against Bush instead of Reagan, then the very same politics take hold um, and gain much more traction than they would have in 88. Yep, uh, just parenthetically, another thing that uh, I had utterly forgotten, and maybe I and I'm thinking about it particularly today because Joe Biden gave his speech about crime calling for a restoration of the assault weapons ban. I had forgotten how strongly Ronald Reagan supported the assault uh, weapons ban when it was first passed, and he, he was quite eloquent on the topic. Yeah, I mean, this is where you start to see um, particular policy issues. Immigration is one of them, but guns are absolutely another. And in part, you can understand, right? One of the bills that he supported, Reagan, after leaving office was the Brady Bill. It's named after somebody who was shot in an assassination attempt against Ronald Reagan. But even after that, and when it came to the assault weapons ban, Reagan was strongly opposed. He comes out um, with other former presidents, uh, or he was strongly, strongly supportive, supportive of it. Yeah. Um, he comes out with other presidents, says, yes, we should have this um, assault weapons ban. And he runs up against the opposition of the NRA. Now, I think that Pat Buchanan could sue Donald Trump for plagiarism. Uh, you yeah. go to the 1992 campaign, and uh, something I even covered that campaign had, had forgotten, that at the end of that campaign, Pat Buchanan went to the border with Mexico and called for building a wall. That was back in 1992. Talk about the Buchanan uh, campaign where um, you know, it really was this mixture of uh, a certain kind of populism on economics because of trade with these very, very right-wing positions on culture, race, and immigration uh, that was almost a perfect template. It's hard to figure out where Donald Trump's uh, campaign was actually different from Pat Buchanan's. I think that's exactly right. Which is why he's yeah. on the cover, which, I guess. Which is why he makes the cover and not yeah. Trump. Um, yes, so Pat Buchanan even changes quite dramatically on immigration in a very short amount of time. In 1984, when he was talking about um, immigration, he was talking about undocumented immigrants and how they paid payroll taxes and they paid um, uh, they paid sales taxes. They were good tax-paying citizens who weren't on the welfare rolls. It was basically his way of being like, they're better than black people. But he was saying things that were very um, Reagan-esque and also today <laughs> sounded like a Democrat when he was talking about um, immigration. That was not the case just a few years later when he latches on to this idea that those issues of culture and race were the ones that, that Ronald Reagan had failed to exploit, but that was the vein that you got to tap into. And so he starts to talk about the border wall. He called it the Buchanan fence. Um, he starts to tie what he now calls illegal aliens to uh, crime, um, accusations from both him and Attorney General Bill Barr that it was illegal aliens who made up most of the people or a good chunk of the people who were responsible for the riots in Los Angeles in 1992. And this criminalization and this, um, this trying to stoke outrage and emotion around the border was something that took real work. In California in 1991 and 92, only like two or three percent of voters put immigration at the top of their list of concerns. Obviously by 1994 that looks very different with Proposition 187 and it took a political movement to turn immigration into a culture and race issue um, that could be exploited. You know your discussion of Prop 187 is really good and it is really central uh, to this. Let's mention a couple other characters who play a very big uh, role in your book correctly, so I think. One is Rush Limbaugh, uh, 
Um, and let's just stick with Rush for a second because I think you talk about two interrelated developments that are so important. One is the rise of conservative talk radio, which Limbaugh was the pioneer of. Um, and he supported Pat Buchanan, so there is a really interesting synergy between mm -hmm. the two of them in 92. Um, but the rise of Rush and then the spread of, of right-wing radio across the AM dial as music migrated to FM. Um, <clears throat> but then you also talk about uh, the rise of uh, cable leading to Fox News. And it's a great discussion because it's not just about the rise of Fox News, uh, who, uh, by the way, important piece of history, Roger Ailes tried to turn Rush Limbaugh into a TV show. Uh, and when that worked, he didn't give up. He just did a whole network yep. instead. Um, but you, you talk about how other kinds of cable, not just Fox, um, really helped change the nature of the political dialogue. Absolutely. Dialogue and, is a polite word, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, dialogue is an interesting word because yeah. this was an age of a newly interactive media landscape. That ability, um, what made Rush Limbaugh so important wasn't just that he was a conservative entertainer, but that his show was interactive, that you could call and you could actually talk to him. This is also the era where you have like- God help you if you disagreed uh, with him. Well, though. yes. <laughs> um, he's, he had collar abortions, um, which was a, an incredibly offensive thing that he did early in his career where he would abort collars he disagreed with. Um, but you had like Larry King Live, where you, again, you could call in and you could be part of this new cable television. It's where Ross Perot launches his campaign in 1992. And that interactivity is so important. Um, and so many of the experiments in cable news in the 1990s were about trying to take, essentially talk radio and put it on television. Um, so you have a, a network that's a precursor to MSNBC called America's Talking. Um, you have something called National Empowerment Television, which is a precursor to Fox News in many ways. I see a head shaking as somebody who was probably on it. I think he was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I thought so. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, so you have these real experiments in in cable, in talk radio, and it is, again, it's it's diversifying what's available on um, television, but it's also creating this new conservative punditry that, as EJ sort of indicated earlier, was not necessarily just happening on something like Rush Limbaugh's show or on Fox News. It was much more intensively happening. I mean, Pat Buchanan comes up on CNN's Crossfire and PBS's The McLaughlin Group. Um, as you mentioned, Ann Coulter and Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram all get their start on MSNBC and on entertainment shows like Politically Incorrect. <laughs> which you know, debuts in 1993. It spends a few years on Comedy Central, defines that channel um, in the years before The Daily Show, and then moves to ABC. And that's where people like Kellyanne Fitzpatrick, who would later become Kellyanne Conway, um, and Ann Coulter and Dinesh D'Souza start to become more familiar household names because and, and are also experimenting with this idea of politics as outrage and entertainment. And they're perfecting that style, not on Fox News, but on Politically Incorrect and on MSNBC. Um, the other person that needs to be mentioned, well, there are a lot of people in the book who need to be mentioned, but Newt Gingrich. Um, and he is a complicated figure in all this. Newt began as a Rockefeller Republican uh, way back when. Um, and um, you have a really interesting treatment of Gingrich in this. Why don't you talk about him? Gingrich is so interesting because he is kind of on both sides of the story. He is somebody who is deeply interested in language. Um, it, you might have seen a, a, a memo from GOPAC, which was um, his uh, political action committee or the Republican Party political action committee that really focused on language as, as a weapon, um, trying to find like the most delightful words to attach to your friends and the most disgusting words to attach to your enemies. He was very interested in rhetoric um, and in training up a more pugilistic and more conservative set of Republicans that he brings in in the Republican Revolution in 1994. But he also very quickly finds himself outflanked by far more radical conservatives than he is. There's a group called the True Believers who come into office in that 94 election who see Gingrich as somebody who's too willing to compromise, too willing to work with Bill Clinton. And so, for instance, during the government shutdown, which again, 
an, an innovation in congressional brinksmanship. At the time, it was the longest government shutdown in US history. And when Gingrich decides, okay, we're not winning this, we gotta reopen the government, the true believers come forward and they're like, no, why would you reopen the government? We shut it down. Um, so he is constantly sort of under attack. They're constantly trying to unseat Gingrich as Speaker of the House, sort of in a preview to what would happen constantly with, um, with John Boehner in the Obama years. Um, all of that is playing out in much the same way. It's just that that would be even further to the right in the 20 teens. Um, the, the, the Clinton impeachment gets uh, important treatment in your book as a, partly as a kind of new method of this new post-Reagan right. Uh, I didn't know, for example, the role George Conway played. I mean, you, the, the index of this book is very valuable when people, for people to go through, uh, where are they now? Um, but talk about how, and Gingrich was very reluctant initially to go for the Clinton impeachment, even though he got associated with it later. Yeah, Gingrich didn't want to be part of the impeachment at first because he was actually making a lot of headway with Bill Clinton. You know, they're starting off um, after, I think it's after the 96 election, they're sitting down to start to think about how they can roll back Social Security. Um, and then when Clinton comes under fire and when the investigation heats up and Clinton has to shore up his support among Democrats, those talks go away. Um, so you, Gingrich sees real opportunity in working with Clinton that is foreclosed by the impeachment. And, and you have a lot of um, Republicans and in, uh, conservatives, including Laura Ingram, who's like, everyone's talking about impeachment. This is not a great idea. Um, in part because what Clinton was going to be impeached over wasn't that big of a deal. Um, and so there is this, um, this battle over whether impeachment is going to happen and that Gingrich is reluctant to get into. He is probably also reluctant because his own marital record was not, you know, as clear as Perfect. it could be, right? <laughs> um, so, so anyway, he gets dragged into it, but then when he decides to do it, he does it. Um, so there's a very sort of, it, it really does tap into his desire for a political fight. Um, and he goes all in when, when impeachment finally gets underway. So I want to open it up to the audience, so I, I just want to jump ahead. By the way, a, uh, on your media treatment, I think I see a veteran of the McLaughlin group in the audience. Uh, at its peak, hello, uh, at its peak it had 4.4 million viewers. Yeah, uh, it's which, so uh, much bigger than um, just about anyone else. Yeah, no, it's, uh, anyway, it's a, there's an interesting uh, treatment of that. Um, you, so we well, let's go from Clinton to W, whom you see as the last Reaganite, in a way, um, there's a lot of sunniness there. He was uh, willing to, you know, he tried to sell compassionate conservatism for a while before the war came along. Um, talk, and by the end, he was as hated on the right uh, by many parts of the right as he was by, uh, by the, uh, the, not the entire right, but significant parts of the right as he was by the left. And of course, his immigration reform failed which I have always taken as the first sign of what was coming. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, and, and if I could, uh, I'd like to link, um, well, yeah, we'll go from there to the Tea Party to Trump, and then we'll open it up. All right, all right. Um, so, so George W. Bush, even at the time, was being compared to Reagan. Everyone was talking about how he was the heir to Reagan, which is a real blow to George H.W. Bush. It's so mean. Um, <laughs> but it was because he had that idea of compassionate conservatism, that he wanted to do immigration reform um, after 9-11, that he was talking a lot about democracy and foreign policy. He passes, um, before 9-11, the largest... I think at the time, the largest tax cut in American history. Um, so he's doing stuff that feels very Reaganite in his presidency. And one by one, he disproves every part of the philosophy. Um, so you have, with financial deregulation and with the tax cuts, you ultimately have the collapse of the global economy. Um, you take that idea of Reagan's, the nine worst words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, and you superimpose that over the Hurricane Katrina response, um, obviously the debacles in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so by the end of his presidency, um, so much of what looked Reagan-esque about his policy platform and his approach 
not looking so great um, in terms of its its outcomes. Um, and so there is this sense that in some ways he puts the final nail in Reaganism because it empowers um, a more paleoconservative and paleo-libertarian uh, right to surge. Um, obviously the, the opposition to immigration reform um, continues to solidify in the aftermath of his presidency. So there are a number of different ways that he helps along um, the right that I'm talking about, these partisans, through his failures. And now I'll just end with the Tea Party, because uh, the Tea Party was seen by some as mainly libertarian. Actually, it wasn't. It was much more, there was an anti-government element of it, but not against Social Security or Medicare, since a lot of the people in the Tea Party were over 65, and with a very strong anti-immigration sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's uh, the Tea Party is almost a bridge between the Buchanan campaign and the Trump campaign, is how I read the book. I, I think that's exactly right. You know, there was, I'll just tell one little anecdote. You know, there was this sign during the Tea Party that was mocked mercilessly on the left. It said, keep your government hands off my Medicare. And that's funny. But at the same time, like, there's a kind of right-wing populism, um, an almost like George Wallace-like populism that is contained in that ironic, contradictory claim, right? The government should be helping me, a white person. Um, it's those other welfare programs that folks should oppose. Um, and I, I think that's that was missed in a lot of ways because it was read as a libertarian movement. I want to invite people. We've got a microphone here, uh, and uh, th speaking in the mic would be good for the uh, TV audience. So let's uh, uh, thank you. Uh, this is always a crowd that has good questions. Uh, Do you talk about the fact, getting back to Reagan, do you talk about the fact that he was actually a practiced professional actor and he played an optimistic president and mourning in America? I was an attorney, a staff attorney in the EPA, uh, in the Reagan administration, and my late husband was at the EEOC. And all that optimism, Reagan is the one who said government is not the solution to a problem. Yes. Government is the problem. The, the American public has turned against government in the New Deal. Government was representative of the people going after the corporations and the corruption and the financial stuff. Um, that's a contradiction. And I think all of that uh, morning in America was nonsense. You should you should have seen what was going on behind the scenes. Yeah, I, I do I do write about some of the chicanery that's happening, chicanery, some of the um, moves that are happening within the administration, and how Reagan distances himself from those moves when they're unpopular for precisely the reason that you're talking about, because he wanted to continue to shore up that public image, and the fact that he was an actor is really important. Um, now I do make the distinction between. Reagan, the actor who's kind of part of the old media system of um, uh, stu the studio system in Hollywood and that sort of network television system of the 1950s versus this new, hotter, more interactive media that would come later. And Reagan also laundered his um, past as an actor through his time as governor of California. Mm -hmm. So he comes in with some uh, political bona fides that people like Pat Robertson, Pat Buchanan, later folks who run for president instead of running for anything else, um, yeah. bring to the table. Um, but those, those similarities are very important, and that idea of discrediting government is absolutely a through line, um, something that wasn't just part of Reagan's politics, but had been one of the big goals of that Cold War conservative movement. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and just in defense of, uh, thank you for the question, in defense of your argument, you're not denying that there isn't a long through line of the American right, but there is also a particular break, and those two things can be true at the same time. Right, that there's a, a rupture, and that so much of the contemporary commentary about politics places that rupture in 2016. I'm like, I think it starts a little earlier than that. Right. Thank you. Great, uh, Rob Wilson Black, most recently of Sojourners. Great book, loved it. First a quick thanks and then a question. The thanks for putting Richard Vigory in there, uh, <laughs> very important. Uh, he was my first uh, interview when I was 16 years old. We talked about abortion and I'll never forget that. The question is about religion. I had forgotten that Pat Robertson uh, came in second place in Iowa caucuses uh, in front of, I guess, George H.W. Bush. 
Um, uh, behind Dole, it was a was bad it behind night. Dole and then above Bush, Bush. above Bush. Yeah, amazing. No, I remember that. I night. completely <laughs> forgot that you were covering it. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, my question is: was was religion on the whole, or white evangelical Christianity in specific, more of a tool that was used on the politicians of the time, uh, the Republicans of the time, or was it more a tool they used? Uh, for instance, Ronald Reagan saying, "I know you can't endorse me, but I endorse you," or was it, or was it both? Were they hammered by it, or did they pick it up and use it? This is one of those questions that's really important because you do have these incredibly significant religious figures and religious politics, white evangelical politics and people who are important to this book, to Pat Robertson, um, Ralph Reed, who uh, is leading the Christian coalition in the 1990s and is doing a lot of compromising in really interesting ways uh, in the 1990s around those politics, which in part goes to the answer of it's a tool, right? You use it to um, attract certain voters and you you get rid of it when it's no longer useful for you. Um, You pledge to get rid of abortion. At the time, it looked like you were just pledging it and not actually doing it. Looks a little different in the wake of Dobbs. Um, But I, I think that that is too easy of an answer to just say that like, oh, religion is just this tool being used by politicians. What was fueling um, the conservative movement in the really the 70s, the 80s, and into the 90s? Um, in 1992, I think, um, white evangelicals, Christian coalition members actually made up a majority of delegates to the Republican National Convention. I mean, th- these were the foot soldiers of the right. Um, and it was something that Vigory saw and the new right saw, and they were really trying to harness this movement. Um, somebody that I write about in the book, Helen Chenoweth, um, the representative from Idaho, who would be a pretty radical figure in the 1990s, she founds um, a kind of a version of Focus on the Family in Idaho. She is supported not just by militias um, and libertarians in Idaho, but she is also supported by women Mormons and evangelicals um, who, again, are the foot soldiers of the campaign. So I think it is a more complicated answer. I think that when we talk about religion and politics solely in a utilitarian way, just like when we talk about media and we're like, oh, Fox News is just manipulating everyone. Sometimes people want to be manipulated or sometimes people have these views that they're um, helping to circulate in those media. And I think that's the more complicated answer. Please. Oh, yeah. I'm a big fan of your work. Can't wait to read your book. Uh, question for you: As in, in the period that, that you write about, the Democrats are moving to uh, are, are moving to the right as well. Although weirdly, you know, starting with a with the Bork confirmation in, in <coughs> excuse me. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the de- how the Democrats movement impacted what the Republicans did because you know, but Clinton is. I mean, was, I mean, Clinton. Govern is kind of as kind of a moderate new Democrat. He was he was no. I mean, the the liberals distrusted Clinton as much as the the far right types distrusted Reagan. So, talk about that, please. I'm yes, of course. Okay. Um, well, this is what's so interesting and what um, sort of confounds one argument that some people make about the 1990s that it was an era of polarization. And then you look at it and you're like, but the Democrats were moving to the right. They weren't moving to the left. Um, so how is it a, a decade of polarization? Polarization is not um, a political process that's being described in the 1990s. It's a political tool being used by people like Newt Gingrich to make it look like, oh, the Democrats are enemies and they're an existential threat, while at the same time he's having these backroom negotiations with Bill Clinton. And if you wanted to um, apply a causal explanation to the Democrats moving to the right, the the bigger story I'm telling, you could say, well, the Democrats are moving to the right, so the Republicans have to move even further right in order to heighten the contradictions between the Mm two. I don't think it's the Democrats' fault, but I do think that that is part of the process at play. And you especially see this around immigration, you know, Proposition 187 was not just about Republicans. Democrats opposed it, but they supported pretty much everything up to Proposition 187. And Janet Reno is um, expanding Border Patrol in San Diego at the time, and Dianne Feinstein saying some really nasty things about immigrants at the time. Um, So yeah, there there is this rightward shift in politics and the culture more broadly. Um, What you see on the right is a much broader swing, and a different kind of right mm-hmm. um, than than you had seen in an earlier era. Gotcha. Thank you. Could, thank you. Uh, could you talk a bit about um, women on the right? 
uh, which is, a, I read this and I felt that's your next book, uh, because women play a very important role in your account. Chen the, the, you, you focus on Chenoweth correctly, I think, as a fascinating figure and a revealing figure at that time, but you talk a lot about Laura Ingram, you obviously talk about Phyllis Schlafly. Talk about this element of this right. Yeah, so if we think about Phyllis Schlafly um, as kind of a, a second wave anti-feminist, somebody who is opposed to the second wave feminist movement of the 1960s and 1970s, who is appealing to a kind of housewife conservatism in which her role as a housewife, even though she was a political activist, she was um, a, a well studied in, in the law and foreign policy, but that she chose to present herself as a housewife um, and oppose the Equal Rights Amendment, oppose the feminist movement. Um, that, is, that is kind of the, the anti-feminism of the 1960s, 70s, 80s. By the 1990s, you see kind of this third wave anti-feminism that has consolidated the gains of the feminist movement. People like Laura Ingram and Ann Coulter are lawyers. Um, the women of the, international, of the Independent Women's Forum are all in high-powered professions. Many of them aren't married. Many of them um, don't want to have children. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't matter. They're like, that's, that's fine. We're professional women. Um, they don't talk about things like abortion. They talk about guns instead. Um, they wear miniskirts instead of kind of the, the shirt dresses that someone like Phyllis Schlafly would wear. And they really leaned into provocation both in the... Uh, a sort of political provocation sense and provocation in like the sexual sense. Um, and so they're crafting this new, edgier, sexier, um, more provocative, more interesting, because it's newer, um, anti-feminism that becomes really powerful. It becomes a model, I think, for later um, women activists like Sarah Palin, um, Michelle Bachman, and somebody like Helen Chenoweth there is a lineage there between her and somebody like um, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Just if you could hold one second, because I want to go back to Chenoweth, especially in light of the violence we're talking about now, um, your, com your, uh, your work on the malicious is really important. And we forget how, I, I, well, not a lot of people don't forget, but the, in the 1990s, the Oklahoma City event was enormous, and the, 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 death ra the deaths were is sort of chilling, um, but I, I wonder, again, what's the parallel of the rise of the militia movement then to some of the violence we're seeing? And by the way, in, in your defense, this is not a presentist book. It just happens that so much of this history leads to the present. But so the rise of the militia movement in the 1990s is, is really important. It has its origins in the 70s and 80s with the rise of um, Posse Comitatus um, and some white power groups that gained steam and began to go to war with the federal government. As you the Oath read Keepers about. go all the way back then, yep. which I didn't realize. Yep. Yeah. Um, Kathleen Ballou talks about this in her wonderful book, um, Bring the War Home, if you want sort of more background on it. But after the events of uh, Waco and Ruby Ridge, um, those become kind of martyrdom moments for this new militia movement, and it brings m so many more people into the militia movement. And as the militia movement becomes bigger and more active, politicians like Helen Chenoweth, who is a representative from Idaho, Ruby Ridge is in her district, begin to see these militia members uh, and their politics as part of their base. And so she's out there talking about black helicopters and conspiracy <laughs> theories about the UN. She's, um, her tapes are being sold in the militia of Montana's um, uh, sales book next to bomb making manuals. Um, there's a real interplay between um, her politics and this militia movement because she sees them as part of who she's appealing to. And particularly with Chenoweth and a couple of other members from Texas and from the West, you start to get a real thinning of the lines between the violence of the militias and th the mainstream of, of Republican office holders. Um, and this really comes to a fore with the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, because Chenoweth doesn't, d doesn't defend the bombing, um, but she does say, you know, people are mad for a reason, and if you don't like, deal with the reasons that they're mad, maybe more things like this are going to happen. Um, and so there is a kind of defensiveness around militias and an unwillingness to cut ties with militia members that is 
really important and is probably fairly resonant for people today. Sir, thanks for your patience. I once, I once ran into Newt Gingrich at the Easter service at the National Shrine and told him I thought he'd get better when he became a Catholic and he had nothing to say about that. <laughs> My question is, <laughs> there's so little foreign policy content on the right these days. My, my brother is an anti-com, was a conservative who has forgotten he was anti-communist. Can you talk about that at all and why you think it happened? Because the Cold War was such a central um, organizing factor of um, the conservative movement during the Cold War, it, it was very easy to know what your foreign policy was going to be. It took a while. In the 1940s and 1950s, there are these vicious battles on the right over what their foreign policy should be. Should it be more isolationist? Should it be more aggressive and militaristic? And they decide on the second one. Um, with the end of the Cold War, all bets are off. There's a new conversation happening around foreign policy. And while I, I agree there's not necessarily always a very clear foreign policy content to the right today, there are still some pretty vicious battles. And foreign policy does still play a very central role to how the right talks about politics. Um, it's just that there isn't, um, there isn't a clear I ideology around foreign policy, I think, right now on the right. And that just means that there's a lot of um, heterodoxy and heterogeneity um, on the right when it comes to foreign policy. Yeah, and I think you see some of the split you're describing in the book in the splits in the Republican Party over Ukraine, which I think Absolutely. is sort of a perfect measure of that old argument. Um, well, I think we have one more person in line, am I correct? Yes, a veteran. <laughs> Thank you, it's great I, uh, to see you. I'm uh, Bruce Bartlett, and I was intimately involved in almost all the history in your book. But there's one thing I I've been thinking I was hoping you'd that, come up. Thank oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get any footnotes like, like you, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Next one of the things I've been thinking about for some reason lately is the 88 campaign and mm. the fact that you had Jack Kemp running. And now Jack was clearly the, the heir to, to Reaganism. And, and he was defeated, but more importantly, he retired from Congress, which opened up a huge uh, vacuum that was filled by Newt Gingrich. I mean, if Jack had stayed in Congress, he would have been Speaker of the House in 1995. There's no question about that. Uh, and so I think that that, sometimes we think too much about things that did happen rather than things that didn't happen. And, 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 and also, there, there was an important article that Bob Woodward wrote a few years ago about how Gingrich was actively engaged in the defeat of George H.W. Bush in 1992. And, 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 and this is, I think he saw the way the wind was blowing. He may have had some knowledge that Bob Michael was going to retire. He could see that all these Southern Democrats were just on the brink of all becoming Republicans and that this would create the possibility of a Republican majority. And so, I, I don't know, somehow I see these events as uh, being interrelated and I was sort of right in the middle of it because I was worked in the Reagan White House and then I was over at the Treasury Department where we were involved in raising taxes and things of that sort and I was one of the very few Reagan people who who survived the Bush uh, trans transition. Uh, I mean, he tr he fired everybody just as if it, he was a, a Democrat, and a lot of people didn't forget that, and it came back to haunt him in '92. So anyway, that was all I had to say. No, Bruce, this is great because there is a little bit of the counterfactual that I point to in the book. Um, partly, like Jack Kemp really was this policy entrepreneur, and Gingrich too was a policy entrepreneur. Like he was a guy with a few too many ideas um and so he fills that vacuum but also remember um well so jack kemp also comes out against proposition 187 he's like this is not the direction the republican party should go um and remember there's that moment in 1996 when people start floating the idea that colin powell could become the republican nominee and what a different party it would be if colin powell had won the uh, the Republican nomination in 1996. Now, we have no idea how that would have worked out. We have no idea how he might have changed if or that if had happened. Or if he could have won the pr won. primaries. Uh, we have no answers to any of those things, but it's a really interesting thing to think about. 
I just love the idea, Bruce, of a historian who focuses on the things that didn't happen. That would be an interesting path for a historian. Uh, do we have one more? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the tea, some of the Tea Party's message kind of sounding a bit like George Wallace, and uh, that kind of got me wondering uh, sort of the sort of extreme right of earlier decades, George Wallace and uh, you know other people and, and groups who were kind of um, on the fringes but still sort of important. Uh, is there any kind of connection between them and uh, sort of later sort of conservative partisans in the 90s? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And could I just piggyback on your question because that's a good question. And one figure you treat very seriously in an interesting way also is Ross Perot. And I think and it's an odd relationship of Perot to this movement because he was not an ideological conservative. So if Wallace and Perot as key figures in this book I think is worth closing on. And I'm going to read the last paragraph because it really tells us where this all ends up. Um, so Wallace is a figure in the book because Richard Vigory, um, this new right figure, is looking at Wallace and saying, how do we get that Wallace vote? We want that Wallace vote. We know we need to lean into the politics of resentment. We need to lean into issues of culture and to issues of race. And that's how we're going to win that Wallace vote. And those Wallace voters who, in 1968, represented a pretty big threat to the Republican Party's potential future or a really big opportunity. Perot is the same in a different way um, because so much of the politics of 1993 and 1994 are both Democrats and Republicans being like, how do we get Perot voters? Like, Perot's all over the place. How do we attract his voters? What is it that they're actually attracted to? Because remember that he won like 20% of the vote in 1992. He was a political bomb going off in the middle of the two-party system. Um, and you wouldn't think that hyper-partisanship would grow out of that. But um, you see something like Newt Ging somebody like Newt Gingrich, um, who develops the contract with America not to appeal to the right, but to appeal to Perot voters. That's what that document was about. It's why it doesn't mention Republicans or Democrats or Bill Clinton, because it's trying to attract those Perot voters. The other person that I'll just throw in very quickly, because I think he attaches to the Wallace question, is David Duke. In 1990 and 1991, as Duke is becoming a more um, known figure it's now not Richard Vigory, but Pat Buchanan who's looking over and he's saying, why are Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush denouncing this guy? We need to be figuring out why he's so appealing. Not a hard puzzle. Um, and win his voters. And so part of Pat Buchanan's campaign in 1992 is about the Duke vote, um, just as uh, previous candidates had looked at the Wallace vote. Thank you. And so I, um, the book does not focus on Donald Trump. However, he makes an appearance at the end. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful passage because it really pulls the book together. Um, and there was a debate at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley in 2015. Um, and every candidate on the stage basically appealed to the Reagan legacy except for Donald Trump. Uh, and as you write, uh, Trump understood something the debate moderators and other candidates did not. The age of Reagan was over. It had been over for a long time. And you conclude the book um, with the following two paragraphs. And I'll just close on this. And then you should get the whole book to read everything that came before. Um, few people in the Reagan Library in the fall of 2015, including Donald Trump, believed Trump would be president two years later. Yes, he had risen quickly to the top of the polls and stayed there, but just as 2012 had seen the rise and fall of a string of improbable candidates, uh, the Trump bubble would soon surely burst. They didn't realize that the ground had already shifted, had been shifting for a quarter century, and, as they, and they were only now beginning to catch up. The trip to Simi Valley was just the final stop in a long goodbye. And like Raymond Chandler, who wrote the, a book carrying that name, you solve a lot of mysteries about the right in this book. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you all for such thoughtful questions. And thank you, and Nicole and EJ, another great example of why we study history and why we should study history.